Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my hundredth mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. Today on CityCast Houston. Centerpoint is back in the spotlight today as Texas senators launched their investigation into how the utility company performed during Hurricane Barrel, why so many people lost power, and why it took them so long to bring it back. To help break it all down, I'm talking with Andrew Schneider, News 88.7's government reporter. He recently did a deep dive into Centerpoint's plan to be more resilient and what Houston can learn from places like Florida to be better prepared for the next storm. It's Monday, July 29th. I'm Raheel Ramzanali, and here's what Houston's talking about. Andrew, what's up? Welcome back in. How are you? I'm doing very well, thanks. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited to bring you on because I was listening to your report, which, by the way, I learned so much regarding everything that's happening with Centerpoint and in other states as well. But one thing before we get into some of the facts and some of the reporting I want to talk about the term resilient. Like when we talk about a power company like Centerpoint being more resilient, what exactly are we talking about? We're talking essentially about how quickly a power company can come back from a major disaster. There is no way to make a power company completely disaster proof any more than there's a possibility of making a city or a region disaster proof. What you can do if you prepare properly and you assess the likely threats is to reduce the time that it takes you to get the power back on, to get people's air conditioning back on, their lights back on, and to enable them to go on with their daily lives. Yeah, there's always going to be something that happens, right? There's going to be some type of outages. And when we talk about Hurricane Barrel and Centerpoint's restoration efforts afterwards, Look, they've been heavily criticized by state and local politicians, residents, heck, even us here on the podcast. But I want to take a step back and compare it to what other states have gone through, especially Florida. In your latest story, you actually broke it down. What did you find when you looked at Florida and their resiliency? Florida has been at this for a long time. I've spoken with a number of different people that have been watching the storm situations there And they chart the efforts to try and improve resilience for power companies, depending on whom you ask, either back to 1992 when Hurricane Andrew hit or back to 2004, 2005, when there was a spate of eight named storms in the course of two years. Wow. Um, And... In the aftermath of that second round of storms, the state decided to get a lot more heavily involved. They started asking some really hard questions of Florida Power and Light and Duke Energy and some of their other utilities. And what they found was that a lot of these utilities actually had been taking steps along the line to try and improve resilience but they hadn't been communicating that very well. So part of the process that developed as a result of that was the Florida Public Service Commission, which is their entity that oversees the utilities in the state, decided to have annual open meetings at the beginning or right before every hurricane season so that the state and members of the public could get a better sense as to what the utilities were doing in order to make their transmission and distribution, in their case, generation as well, because they are a completely vertically integrated state when it comes to their utilities, what they're doing to make their facilities more storm resilient. So something that really caught my eye in your story was what happened in 2017 with Hurricane Irma. Now, that hit South Florida as a Category 4 storm, and it was a totally different story than what we saw here in Houston with Barrel. 
How long did the Florida utility company take to restore power? It only took them about a day to get 50% of their 4 million plus affected customers back online. Wait, and, what? And, it, and, and to get all of them back online, it took 10 days, which you know seems like a lot. But when you look at the comparison point there was uh, Hurricane Wilma, which I think occurred in 2005. And at that point, it took, I think, something like five days to get 50% back online and 18 days to get everybody back online. It was pretty strong evidence that whatever Florida Power and Light was doing to get their customers back up was working. How did they manage to do that? Two million people in just one day? Like how? The one overarching thing that I noticed in the course of this was that there seems to be a lot more uh, regulation going on in Florida than in Texas. The Florida Public Service Commission is, is much more aggressive in terms of its oversight and in terms of making sure that the efforts that the utilities are pursuing to become more resilient are the most effective steps that they can possibly take. And one of the people that I spoke with, Ted Curry, who's with the University of Florida, framed it this way. A utility will go before the Florida Public Service Commission and say, we are considering these six steps, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And the Public Service Commissioners will listen to this, they'll do their analysis, and they'll say, we think that A, D, and F are the most effective steps you can take. You will pursue these steps and you will not pursue the others. And that way the consumers are getting the most value for their money in terms of making sure that the electricity system is up and running as quickly as possible. And one of the things that Florida Power and Light focused on in terms of trying to explain what they were doing is they mentioned not only is this improving their response time in an emergency, but it's improving their response time in terms of general reliability, something in the in the order of like 44% increased reliability dating back to, I think it was 2005. Wow. And basically what that means is that it greatly reduces the general outages that people can expect to experience in any given year. So just rather than being off for days, then what you might expect to see after any minor storm with the flickering of power. That's just much less likely to be a problem in Florida. So more regulation is obviously a good thing in, in this example, but was there something specific like, did they upgrade their poles? Were they burying the power line? Something that we've heard about here around the city of Houston. Was there specific things that led to this incredibly fast response after the hurricane? It was both of those. You did see a replacement of quite a lot of, of wooden poles with more durable structures. You did see a lot of undergrounding of power lines. You did see a lot more active vegetation management. You know, that was obviously a big problem for us here in Houston with trees falling on power lines. And one of the things that I kept on hearing about in the course of my reporting for this story was a lot of people weren't sure who was supposed to be responsible for trimming what trees and when. And I suppose I should take a step back here. One of the trade-offs that you have to make in this situation is that depending on what measures you take, there is always a cost associated with them. And Florida ratepayers tend to spend more than they would otherwise if they were looking at trying to hold down costs for the ratepayers. Now, the Public Utility Commission of Texas has been, just based on the people that I've been interviewing, they've been reluctant to raise rates where they don't have to. Doesn't mean that they don't approve rate increases, but they tend to err on the side of holding down the costs for ratepayers, which is an admirable thing, but you get what you pay for. Yeah. And and that I think is is the the lesson that comes out of Florida. You know, people are people are paying for a more resilient system. They're seeing that in their in their uh, utility bills. So Centerpoint does have a plan to become more resilient, which will be about over $2 billion, right? 
Now, in that plan, what exactly are we looking at? Are they going to deploy some of the strategies that have worked in Florida? Is there something new? What have you heard about that? From what I was able to see from this plan, and it runs to about 100 pages, I I encourage anybody who is interested in looking at the details to look at at the digital story for, for my recent reporting because I attached it as an Adobe file. The largest part of that $2 billion is in terms of hardening the transmission and distribution systems. And that's by doing things like replacing wooden structures, wooden power poles with cement or steel structures. Um, There is a much more limited portion of that that is devoted to things like burying power lines. It's focused specifically on freeway crossings. And part of the reason, I suspect, is because Houston, in particular, is very close to the water table. And there is a great risk when you bury power lines that while it makes them much more resilient to windstorms, but it is not much of a help when you're dealing with flooding, for example, like we had with Harvey. You, you run the risk of more damage to the line than you would otherwise. Also bear in mind, if there's any kind of break in the line, say somebody accidentally digs into the line when they're doing construction or something like that, it's much more difficult to find the break in the line than when you've got the power lines overhead. You've also got vegetation management, trying to clear trees that are threatening overhead lines. You've got upgrades to the software, but the most significant portion of that $2 billion is simply making the overground lines more durable. Gotcha. I hate spam, and I know you do as well. And guess what? Spam starts with your personal data being sold. Every day, data brokers collect and sell your personal information to third parties, such as your SSN, address, phone numbers, health and financial records, and much more. These insights are then used by scammers, total strangers, insurance companies, banks, businesses, and even the government to target you with, you guessed it, spam. It's time to protect your data, your time, and your sanity with Incogni. Incogni scrubs your personal info from the web. Simple as that. Incogni takes only three minutes to set up, tackles 180 data brokers and people search sites, and there's a 30-day money-back guarantee. Get Incogni today and never look back. Use code CITYCAST for 55% off the annual plan at incogni.com. That's spelled I-N-C-O-G-N-I dot com. That's incogni.com and use code CITYCAST for 55% off their annual plan. Whoa, landing an account this big will totally change my landscaping business. It's going to mean hiring more guys and more equipment and new trucks for the new guys to drive the new equipment in. I don't know if I'm ready. You can do this, and Ford Pro Fence Simple can help. Our experts are ready to make growing pains less painful for your business with flexible financing solutions that meet the needs of your business today when you need them. Get started at fordpro.com slash financing. Now, you mentioned the demand for more accountability and more financial investment in Florida. Do you think there's the willpower for those things here in Texas, especially right now as we're still thinking about Hurricane Barrel and what we just went through? That's the challenge. One of the big differences between Florida and Texas is that the Public Service Commission really does not let people forget that they are living in a hurricane-prone state. And... One of the things that came up in the course of this was that there was a period of about a dozen years between the worst bout of storms in the mid-2000s and when Hurricane Irma came through. And for that period, as the services were being uh, made more resilient and as bills were going up for consumers, there was a lot of pushback from people who felt that perhaps these uh, constant meetings were not needed. And the Florida Public Service Commission essentially said, it doesn't matter, we're going to keep on doing this anyway. And that paid off. But one of the problems that we've had here in Texas, going back 
as far back as I can remember, is that there is a tendency, the further a storm retreats into the past, to turn our attention to other things. And it doesn't take that long. Winter Storm Uri was only a little over three years ago. Hurricane Harvey was just under seven years ago. And yet here we are asking these same questions with Beryl. I would like to believe that there is the political willpower to address this. Certainly, the lieutenant governor has made no secret of his determination to act on this, to put pressure on Centerpoint and the other utilities to become more resilient. He's not the only person that I've heard from, nor is this something that's limited to one side of the aisle. I've heard statements out of both Republican and Democratic senators and members of the House of Representatives saying the status quo is unacceptable. We need to change this. Yeah. It, but yeah. It, it, sorry to cut you off there, but I'm thinking about the timeline here. You know, you mentioned 2005 to 2006 was that very active time for Florida. And they said, all right, we need to get things in gear and let's focus on the future. 2008, Hurricane Ike, there were about 2 million people out without power here in the city of Houston. And you look at what happens now in 2024, 16 years later, it seemed like we didn't take it seriously back then. So why would we take it seriously now? That's actually an interesting point. And I have to bring this up because it is a point that uh, former County Judge Ed Emmett made to me, not once, but twice in the course of my interview with him. And that was that as bad as the response time may have been in the aftermath of Beryl, it was still faster in terms of restoring power than after Ike. So clearly there are more lessons that need to be learned. Clearly Centerpoint can be doing a better job, but they still managed to get the lights on and the air conditioning on faster than they did back in 2008. Now Ike was a category two storm when it hit Houston, but in Beryl, the city was largely on the dirty side of the storm. So there's a the trade-off there as well. All right. Now let's talk about the Senate committee hearing today. What can we expect from it and who will be there exactly? One would expect um, to hear from representatives from Centerpoint and the other three major utilities in the area that were affected by Beryl. You'll also be hearing from members of the public who will want to be on record in terms of telling their stories, presumably Uh, There are a lot of people out there that were out without power for days or even weeks, and they will want that on the record. If the past is any guide, one would also expect to hear from a number of of invited experts that could talk about uh, what works and what doesn't work. But by and large, uh, since this is only the first hearing of what one would assume would be several, um, it's going to be the opportunity for the members of the committee, a mix of Republican and Democratic senators, to get their views on the record about what needs to happen and what what they think went wrong um, before they ask uh, Centerpoint and other uh, utility companies, executives, what they're planning to do to fix the problem. I think a lot of the initial questioning is going to focus on issues of communication, because the perception is that one of the things that Centerpoint did not do very well at all uh, was communicate with the public about what it was doing and how quickly they might expect to get power back on. There was a lot of uh, a lot of people that I've spoken with that have raised the issue of Centerpoint's outage tracker, which was basically out of commission from the time of the derecho um, several weeks before. Uh, and they're going to be asking questions, I'm sure, about why that was allowed to happen. All right, Andrew, with all of your reporting, everyone you've talked to from here, Florida, and beyond, what's your top takeaway on the big question? How can Houston be better prepared for the next storm? Because as much as we don't want it to happen again, we all know there will be a next time, and we're still in hurricane season right now. Yeah, well, I think. Part of the issue with Houston is the same as it was after Harvey, which is that storms don't respect political boundaries. We need better coordination between Harris County and the surrounding counties. 
in terms of disaster relief and disaster response. It's the county rather than the city government that has the main responsibility here. And that means more involvement, more preparation, and better communication across county lines in advance of a storm like this to try and make sure that the local governments are doing their job in terms of overseeing the actions of the utilities. Beyond that, one just has to hope that the Public Utility Commission and whatever lawmakers decide to do in the next legislature has more staying power. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. Really awesome reporting again, as I mentioned. Really enjoyed the story and just learning more and more about what's been happening not only here in Florida as well. So thank you for taking time to join us and spend a little bit more of your energy from that reporting with us. You're welcome. That was Andrew Schneider, News 88.7's government reporter. We link to his enterprise story about Centerpoint in our show notes, plus where you can catch up on all his reporting. By the way, if you like this story, please text it to a friend who lost power during Hurricane Barrel. And take two minutes to give us a review and leave us a rating wherever you're listening to the podcast. That really helps us out. And for even more news and happenings in Houston, check out our daily newsletter, Hey Houston. You can subscribe with the link in our show notes. That will do it for today. Thank you for listening. I'm Rahil Ramzanali, and I hope you learned something new. Hold on one second. Do y'all hear baby crying in the background? That's, I think my daughter just got home.